Steve Elner has been here to uh, speak at the James Conley Forum. I heard uh, Steve talk uh, quite a few years ago. Steve and I worked together in New Haven with a group called AIM, the American Independent Movement. Um, we worked together on a publication called Modern Times, which was a paper we put out every month, half in English, well, probably three quarters in English and a few pages in Spanish. And uh, so we had a lot of fun in those days. And uh, Steve and I used to make sure that we took the papers around, delivered them to all different locations. They were free in the New Haven area. Uh, there were uh, actions then with the Black Panther Party, the trial there, Bobby Seale in New Haven. So I go back a long way with Steve. Um, I didn't know him when he uh, became a professor. He got his uh, PhD in Latin American history at the University of New Mexico. And since the late 70s, he's taught economic history and political science at the Universidad de Oriente in Puerto La Cruz, Venezuela. Published uh, many books. You might have seen his op-ed uh, articles uh, on the New York Times or the LA Times. You might have heard him, I think, I've heard him on the radio before, I don't know if it was Amy Goodman or another show, but uh, Steve has been uh, talking and writing about Latin America and specifically Venezuela for quite a while. Uh, next year, his latest book, The Pink Tide Experiences, Breakthroughs and Shortcomings in 21st Century Latin American, Latin America by uh, Roman and Littlefield will be published. So you can look for that. If you want to get a preview of that, you could go with Steve over the next month or two. He'll be traveling around North America and, well, Canada, I guess, and the United States giving different lectures and all. So this is a preview tonight. So let's uh, give a third time warm welcome to Steve Elmer. Thank you for that. Uh, let me, I might uh, Want the mic? be useful to use the microphone. I don't know whether that would uh, help. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction, Art, and thank John for the, um, for the invitation. Uh, the last time I spoke here, I believe it was in 2015, and um, that was really the beginning of a, an ebbing of the pink tide throughout Latin America. In November of 2015, Macri was elected president of Argentina, so that represented a setback uh, for Kirchner, who represented the pink tide in, in Argentina, that had governed Argentina for um, for, for almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. And then the next month, uh, the opposition won the elections for the National Assembly in Venezuela by a landslide vote. Mm -hmm. um, and, one th and so th there's been a chain of defeats for the Pink Tide. Uh, Evo Morales lost the elections by a slim margin in, I think it was February of 2016, uh, a referendum which would have allowed him to run for president again. He still might do that. Uh, but that represented another defeat. In Ecuador, uh, Rafael uh, Correa's candidate won the elections and then broke with Correa and has moved to the right or to the center. Um, in Brazil, uh, Dilma Rousseff was impeached, uh, an unconstitutional uh, move on the part of the opposition in Brazil. Um, the Frente Farabundo Martí lost the uh, municipal elections in El Salvador. So this has been, and the events in, in Nicaragua. So uh, I think it's necessary to take a look at what's happening uh, throughout Latin America, which represented a, a ray of hope for progressives throughout the world. In fact, at the left forum uh, in those days, I remember Venezuela getting mentioned all the time uh, in different uh, sessions. Um, 
uh, Chavez and you know, what was going on in Venezuela was an inspiration for progressives throughout the world. Um, so an analysis of what has happened I think is essential. Um, now, if things have gone from bad to worse in the case of Venezuela with the hyperinflation. Uh, and, you know, under Obama, there was over hostility from the United States that manifested itself in many different forms, one of which was the Obama executive decree that declared Venezuela an extraordinary, unusual threat to national security of the United States, which was absurd. It was absurd, and uh, perhaps a lot of people thought it didn't really make sense. I mean, you know, why is Obama doing that? There wasn't any teeth to that executive order other than sanctions against a few Chavista officials, but it was extremely important because it was a signal to the private sector, which of course was not uh, friendly to the Chavista government to begin with, but it was a signal to get out of Venezuela. Um, but under uh, Trump, uh, that hostility has reached a new threshold. Uh, I think there's a qualitative difference. Even though you can say with regard to uh, Trump's policy towards Venezuela, just like a lot of other issues like immigration, uh, the, his policy towards the, the Middle East and specifically Syria, um, that Obama paved the way. The policies of the Obama administration really led in to a more radical approach on the part of yeah. Trump. Um, but uh, in the past, you've never had a kind of activist diplomacy uh, that we're seeing with uh, Trump, in which high-ranking officials of the Trump administration have traveled throughout Latin America, calling on governments that are hostile to, to the Chavista government to begin with, to play an even more active role uh, to bring about regime change in Venezuela. Wow. Uh, uh, the US ambassador to the United Nations, Haley, in Colombia, calling on the recently elected uh, president of Colombia uh, to, um, uh, to play a more active role, to play a leadership role, uh, James Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, traveling to Brazil and telling the Brazilian government to do the same thing and hopeful or, or optimistic that he will do that. Um, uh, and, and it really began with uh, Tillerson, who kicked off his Latin American tour in Austin, Texas, in which he uh, discussed the possibility of a military option. And basically, the argument is that the opposition of Venezuela is not going to be able to do it itself. And there's a, rea there's a, a, a logic behind that. Right. The fact of the matter is that the opposition of Venezuela, which has never enjoyed widespread popularity, mm -hmm. has always been discredited from the very beginning um, uh, because of the fact it doesn't have a uh, program, it doesn't, it doesn't have, it's, it's discourse, its narrative is just anti-government, anti-Chavez, and now anti-Maduro, but it doesn't really lay out a plan. And it doesn't do that because most of the opposition is uh, blatantly pro-neoliberal, but not all of the opposition. Parts of the opposition are ambiguous about neoliberalism. So they're divided, and their way out is to just not say anything. Um, uh, so the opposition has not enjoyed widespread support. But in the last couple of years, um, even more so, uh, because it's vacillated, it uh, uh, supported street demonstrations in 2017, four month period of demonstrations that paralyzed activity day after day for four months. In Spanish or in Venezuela, it's called the Guarimba. Uh, it's a word that's used for, for these uh, protests. I don't think, I don't know whether Regis de Bray would be pleased with that uh, utilization of foquismo um, that, that Che and Fidel used in, in Cuba, but the idea was that small groups could confront uh, symbols of national authority, 
and weaken the national government and eventually overthrow it. So uh, that, that, that's been the strategy um, going back to 2003. Uh, but they employed it in a big way in 2014. The Guarimba lasted four months in 2014 and 2017, four months as well. But that failed. There were 130 deaths. So many of them were Chavistas. Some of them were the opposition. Some of them were innocent bystanders. Because these weren't all peaceful demonstrations. They were all illegal demonstrations. They all disrupted traffic. Uh, they weren't on sidewalks. They were on streets. Their claim was, well, you know, uh, these are peaceful demonstrations, and they weren't during the daytime. But then at nighttime, a new crew came in, and they attacked National Guardsmen and policemen. And so in those confrontations in 2014, um, I think it was six or seven National Guardsmen were killed. One or two policemen were killed. Uh, uh, and so the opposition in 2017 supported those protests, encouraged the protests. Um, the presidential candidate against Chavez and against Maduro, uh, Enrique Capriles, day after day announced the demonstration, the march is going to go to the downtown section of Caracas, knowing full well that the government would not permit that uh, because everybody knew that if the protesters were to reach the downtown section of Caracas, they would stay there. And opposition people from all over the country would go to Caracas. You'd have 200, 300, 400,000 people in downtown Caracas surrounding the presidential palace with all the international media there. And the president, President Maduro, would have at that point had to resign. There wouldn't have been any way out. So the government knew that. That was the scenario that the opposition employed in 2002 with a coup that did succeed for two days, and the government was not about to allow that again. But Capriles, the main opposition leader, uh, called on the demonstration, demonstrators stated, we're going to downtown Caracas. Day after day, there were confrontations with the police and with the National Guardsmen, with guards people, with, with sometimes um, wounded people, Sometimes people were killed. Um, and the opposition went from that to participation in the elections of, to, of October of 2017. The government uh, announced gubernatorial elections, and the Guarimba was more or less called off. And from one day to the next, the opposition, which was supporting these protests, 130 people killed, they go from that to participating in elections. So if you consider the government to be illegitimate, if you consider Venezuela to be a dictatorship, how do you explain that uh, turnabout? And many people in the opposition who, dis who, who hate the Chavistas, hate Maduro, also detest the opposition. So the opposition is very much discredited. And the argument of Tillerson, the argument of those who talk about a military option, um, is based on that realization that the opposition is not going to be able to do it. Um, uh, so Tillerson, when he kicked off his tour, announced that. That was uh, a trial balloon to see how the rest of Latin America was going to respond. And they have not supported. The, the governments, even though they're rightist and centrist governments throughout Latin America, they have stated openly, publicly, that they do not support military intervention in Venezuela. I mean, you know, they would have to deal with internal opposition, which would be massive, uh, and so they have ruled that out. Uh, Trump has, in spite of the fact that when he discussed it in his cabinet, this came out in a New York Times article, um, even though Trump uh, discussed that at a cabinet meeting, and his own cabinet stated that Trump should not announce this publicly and was opposed to that strategy. But uh, he went ahead, and Latin American leaders like Macri, who you know has been very aggressively opposed to the Chavista government of Venezuela, nevertheless uh, rejected that. So, uh, so. The point I'm trying to make here is that
this represents a new threshold, that you have um, uh, a um, open campaign against the Chavista government, and unlike Obama and unlike Bush, there's an activism in which top officials of the Trump administration are traveling throughout Latin America. And uh, they're basically their only message on these trips is, what are we going to do about the, the, the Venezuelan problem? Um, uh, so um, that represents a change. It represents an escalation of the uh, position of Washington on Venezuela. The, uh, the, the other thing is, or the other point that I wanted to make is that the campaign against Venezuela takes in, of course, the media. And the media has been very successful in convincing large numbers of people here in the United States, probably majority, that Venezuela is a dictatorship. And I think it's important to discuss that uh, because the devil is in the detail. And uh, I, I would argue that, and I'm going to plan on talking about this towards the end of my talk, but I would argue that solidarity work um, with regard to Venezuela, uh, it is necessary to go into details in order to uh, demonstrate that Venezuela is not a dictatorship. Uh, a lot of people say, and a lot of people working very hard on solidarity work, say, I don't really care about those details. The United States has no right to intervene in Venezuela. And so that's the only thing I'm concerned about. I spoke to somebody in Boston um, who's very active in solidarity work in, in that area. And that's, that's what he said, although he also was very interested in knowing more about Venezuela. But he said that that really wasn't necessary. And I said, and well, we talked about this, it was an interesting conversation. And I said, you know, it seems to me that when it comes to the Middle East, that's the case. There's military involvement of the United States in the Middle East, in Syria, in Iraq, in, in Afghanistan. And that's the bottom line. The United States has no business there. Um, and you don't have to know anything about Assad. I know very little about him, about what's going on in Syria, Middle East expert. Um, but with U.S. military involvement, that's all you have to really say. But in the case of Venezuela, it's different. Firstly, because you don't have, up until today, uh, military uh, involvement of the United States in Venezuela. Um, and secondly, uh, in spite of the fact that my knowledge of Syria and the rest of the Middle East is limited, I would argue that there's no comparison. Because even though there are mistakes that are being made, and even though there are downsides when it comes to economic policy, and to a much lesser extent, um, human rights and you know democracy, but there are things you can criticize on that front as well, uh, that the positive sides outweigh the negative sides by a lot. And that solidarity work has to mention that because you're going to be much more successful in convincing people uh, that the United States should not intervene in Venezuela in any form, militarily or economically, uh, and that the media is not telling the truth. Um, if there's a positive opinion about Venezuela, even though it may be a critical position, which is mine, by the way. And it, it kind of reminds me, or I think a comparison can be made, with Vietnam. Why is it that in the 60s there was such massive resistance and opposition to the war in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. And that hasn't, in spite of the fact that the war in the Middle East, Afghanistan and Iraq, have, has been going on for a much longer period of time, why is the anti-war movement so weak? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. Right. A lot of reasons. But one of them, I would argue, is that Ho Chi Minh was somewhat of an icon figure, um, Joan Baez notwithstanding. <laughs> um, but thanks to Jane Fonda. Uh, you know, not everybody agreed with that, but 
uh, most people had a positive, most people on the left had a positive opinion of n the North Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, and perhaps Assad as well. So that, 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 that's important to know something about the Venezuelan case. And the first thing that I want to mention in that regard is that Venezuela is quite different from the United States in so many ways that it is difficult for people in the United States to really appreciate and to understand and to comprehend what's going on in Venezuela. And if you have a U.S. mindset, you may well be convinced that uh, there is flagrant violation of human rights in Venezuela just because of the fact that you don't realize what the Venezuelan context is. The contextual um, analysis uh, provides uh, an understanding of what's at stake and what's going on. Uh, to give you a couple of examples, when I, when I wrote about the, the Guarimba in Venezuela, the four months in 2014 and 2017. And I said in some, some of the pieces that I posted on my Facebook page and some of the articles, um, I talked about civil disobedience. Because these protests began as civil disobedience, as I mentioned before. And then at nighttime, they took on a different form. But in the daytime, uh, these were young kids, a lot of, some of them were students, um, and they were blocking traffic. And that's civil disobedience. And I realized that uh, I had to define what was going on because civil dis disobedience has different connotations here in the United States. In Venezuela, you had uh, people who are blocking traffic. Their protests were not on the sidewalks. They were on the streets. They built barricades. They block traffic in key strategic intersections, main drags, blocking traffic between cities, like where I live. Uh, there are twin cities, and there's a third municipality in between the two of them. And you couldn't get from one to the other. And this was four months, day after day. And in most cases, very few people were participating. Although, as a whole, there were a lot of, I'm not saying that it wasn't a large movement. There were a lot of people involved, but in most of these areas where traffic was being blocked, uh, sometimes there weren't anybody, any people. And sometimes there were just you know two or three. Other times there might have been more. But where I live, uh, in a street corner that uh, connects one municipality with another, um, I just counted once a hundred a hundred people on one occasion, but. On most occasions, there were just a handful. Um, so th that, it seems to me, is different from Martin Luther King um, and Gandhi and Mandela. Uh, these were massive demonstrations, and they weren't blocking traffic and shutting down. And if they did, it, 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 it was a massive kind of thing. OK, hundreds of thousands of people. But that wasn't the case in Venezuela. Um, you know, and the other thing is that the police didn't move in. They didn't arrest people um, because of the media. And so the media made a difference. When you have a media that is 100% opposed to the government, uh, that affects the government's strategies. You know, because if the police moved in and started arresting people, you know, CNN, CNN would have been there. And that would have been broadcasted, that would have been transmitted throughout the world. So that was a limiting factor. Uh, and these protesters, protesters believed that they had a right to do what they were doing. This is democracy. We believe in democracy. And the police has no reason to move in and prevent us from uh, demonstrating. And you know, I, I mentioned uh, a, an example of a friend of arts and mine uh, by the name of Sid Resnick in New Haven, uh, an old-time leftist who I, I went to an anti-apartheid demonstration at Yale University. And uh, there were a group of people who were arrested. 
um, part of the, the civil disobedience uh, strategy. But they sat down with the police the day before, and everything was worked out. They told the police what was going to happen. They knew that they would be brought down to the police station. They'd have to pay a fine. And I'm not saying that the police were the good guys, but there was no bad feelings, you know, on that occasion. Um, that wasn't the case of Venezuela. These things weren't being worked out. And the, as I said before, this civil disobedience transformed itself into armed confronta confrontations at nighttime. So this is the first point I want to make, that for a U.S. audience, um, people have different mindsets, they have different paradigms, and they, they're not able to contextualize what's happening in Venezuela, and the media isn't of any help at all, everything to the opposite. Another example, um, what, something that I just mentioned, Kapilas, um, calling on the demonstrators in the wealthy eastern part of, uh, of Caracas to head to the downtown section because they had a right to bring their message to the Attorney General's office or to Congress or any of these offices located in the center of Caracas. That was their constitutional right. Well, here in the United States, you would think you would applaud that. Um, but if you knew what happened in 2002, when the coup was set off, and that was a planned strategy, there was a massive demonstration of the opposition in the eastern part of Caracas. Nobody, you know, none of those people knew what was in store for them. And the leaders announced on the spot, we're going to downtown Caracas. And that resulted in violence. It resulted in about 18 or 19 deaths. Half of them were Chavistas, half of them were opposition people, and that led into the coup. So these are two different situations, and that's why context is important, uh, and that's why it's necessary to know the details uh, in, 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 in order to, you know, in discussions with people, to uh, uh, deal with illusions, deal with misconceptions, and deal with the lies and the uh, misleading statements of the corporate media. And the third example that I wanted to use is what happened last year. There were four, four months of these, these demonstrations, and the, it was a stalemate. Um, it didn't look like there was any way out of the situation. Day after day, there were confrontations, people were getting killed, the opposition people were, were launching uh, uh, um, uh, missiles at uh, an Air Force base in Caracas, in the Carlota uh, Airport, There's an uh, Air Force base. And on one of these demonstrations, they attacked the Air, Air Force base. So that's, uh, you know, what civil disobedience look like in, in Venezuela. So uh, it was a desperate situation. Uh, Maduro uh, did something that was kind of risky. He called a constituent assembly, and that constituent assembly basically sidetracked the national assembly, in other words, Congress, that was in the hands of the opposition. Um, and that constituent assembly called for gubernatorial elections. And that's what I was mentioning before. That's when the opposition, you know, uh, right at that point, they called off the protests and they participated in the gubernatorial elections. So that was a masterstroke on the part of Maduro. But when the Trump administration and others talk about the dictatorship in Venezuela, they're referring many times to the fact that you don't have a separation of powers because the National Assembly has been pretty much shunted aside. Um, and the Constituent Assembly has replaced the National Assembly. And since the opposition boycotted the elections for the Constituent Assembly, all of those deputies in the, or delegates rather, in the Constituent Assembly's um, Assembly are sympathetic to the government. So the argument is, look at the basically, you know, almost virtually shut down Congress and therefore, we can characterize Venezuela as a dictatorship. But the fact of the matter is that this enabled Venezuela to 
you know, find a way out of this situation that seemed like it was going to be endless. Um, so it, it was really, really beneficial for the country. Uh, and it was beneficial for the Chavista. The Chavistas, the opposition, uh, handled the situation very poorly because they uh, participated in October. And then in December, there were elections. Um, uh, there were elections, I forget now whether there were elections for the, I think, uh, for the mayors, yeah, uh, for the mayors of the different cities. And uh, the opposition parties didn't participate. Some of them did. Most of them didn't. And then their, uh, the presidential elections took place in April of the following year, and the opposition again divided on that. So the opposition, uh, not having a unified strategy, they lost out, and the Chavistas were strengthened, politically speaking. So this is a third example of how context is everything. You know, at first glance, you'd say this is an example of dictatorial or undemocratic uh, moves on the part of the Maduro government. But if you consider the context, a situation which was bloody, it was violent, and you didn't see any way out, this worked. In addition to that, when you consider the fact that the National Assembly, from the very beginning, when they, when the opposition took over the National Assembly, and they elected Henry Ramos, uh, the president of historically the biggest party in Democratic action, as president of the National Assembly, the first thing that he said was, we're going to get rid of uh, Maduro in six months. Well, that could not be done by constitutional means. And, you know, given the Venezuelan context, given the fact that most of those leaders were leaders who participated in the coup in 2002, and participated in the general strike and supported the violent demonstrations and was what political scientists call a disloyal opposition, an opposition that didn't recognize the legitimacy of the government. When he says, we're going to bring about regime change in six months, that didn't necessarily mean by legal means. It was left ambiguous. And there was a lot of reason to believe that really what they had in mind was a different scenario. So this is what we're dealing with. This is not like. Uh, the situation in the United States where, I mean, there's such opposition to Trump within the Democratic Party. Um, but the majority of the Democrats already been talking about impeachment, but that, that is a constitutional path. But nobody's talking about uh, a military coup in the United States. Not so, yet. was that? I'm sorry. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, that, that's not, that's not on the books in the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's not feasible for a number of reasons. No. And nobody is saying that. Nobody desires that. Um, uh, opposition to, to Trump go, uh, is channeled through uh, legal means, through participation in elections, and possible impeachment, which is also 100% legal. Um, so uh, I would uh, say that it's necessary. It's difficult, but it's necessary to explain to people uh, what these differences are. And in the process, to demonstrate that the media is misleading people. And even though the situation is complex, part of the reason why it's so difficult to understand is not only because of the complexity, but because of the media. And I'll just give you one example. During these protests in uh, 2017, the opposition and uh, the uh, media talk about 130 deaths. And it is so deceptive, because a lot of those deaths were Chavistas. And a lot of those deaths were innocent bystanders. And actually, some of them, and this was documented, were protesters themselves who didn't know how to work, you know, didn't know how to manage the weapons that they were using. Uh, and they ended up killing themselves or killing you know, one of their people. So uh, I, don't, I don't know. The, the statistics, but a lot of you know studies demonstrate uh, different things. But one of the deaths was a guy named uh, uh, 
Or Orlando Figueroa. Uh, and I think his first name is Orlando. You know, I, I was cor corrected the other day. I, I made a mistake with his first name, and now I'm trying to remember whether I, I, I got it right this time. But his last name was Figueroa. And he was uh, on, a, on a, one of these gatherings of the opposition, and all of a sudden, and this was filmed from an apartment someplace, uh, so everybody saw it in Venezuela on TV. Somebody threw gasoline on him mm -hmm. and set him to fire. Mm -hmm. how, how many people know about this incident? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so you see everybody running away, including him, um, and uh, he survived about four days, oh. and he stayed in from his hospital bed. They did this because they took me for a chavista. And there's an element of racism and classism uh, involved. But apparently he was a Chavista. He might have been there, you know, just to see what's going on. Who knows? But the, and his mother, uh, after he passed away, said the same thing. They, they killed my son because he was a Chavista. The opposition did uh, damage control. They went into a damage control mode by saying that he was a thief, and they did that because he was a thief. That is not credible, because Venezuela, in Venezuela, that kind of thing doesn't happen in any scenario. Um, and secondly, in a political demonstration, if somebody was caught, you know, robbing somebody, they might have punched him in the head, but they wouldn't have thrown gasoline or some kind of fuel over him and set him to fire. That would have happened. So that is not credible at all. The New York Times published an article, like all their articles, as a matter of fact, you will find an article in all the media in the United States, in all the newspapers, the, the, the main newspapers of different cities throughout the United States. How many are there? You know, 500, 600 newspapers in major cities. You will find one article on, on Venezuela that is even, that is even, even handed. Mm -hmm. None of the, all the articles are anti-Maduro. And the New York Times published an article uh, that was anti-government, but you know, they always throw in something from the other side to try to indicate or try to demonstrate to people that they're objective. So they said, you know, the opposition, sometimes they go to extremes. And this guy Figueroa uh, uh, was caught robbing Somebody and they said they and they I don't remember where they went into the gory details, but okay, he was he was he was killed by the opposition. Now, you know, in my mind, that theory is not at all credible. But the newspaper might have presented both sides, but they didn't. They just presented the side of the opposition. They didn't mention the fact that he himself said that it happened because he was a Chavista, or that his mother said the same thing. So that's just one example of trillions of them that demonstrate that the, uh, that the media is not at all objective. Okay. Um, now, I wanted to, okay, the next thing I wanted to say is that everybody's interested in the economic difficulties in Venezuela. And I, I want to say this, that the narrative of the opposition and what the media does to a great extent as well uh, is to conflate two factors that really have to be separated. And that is the economic difficulties. The media exaggerates to a certain extent, but not by much. The economic situation in Venezuela is very difficult. and the political situation with regard to democracy. To call Maduro a dictator is just blatantly false. Uh, there are some complexities on that front also. As I, I said before, I can provide examples. Uh, but there are downsides to democracy in the United States. I don't have to mention any example of that. <laughs> but consider the rest of Latin America where you know, most of, uh, many countries in Latin America are supporting the uh, Secretary General of the OAS, who's calling for military action, incidentally, in Venezuela, mm -hmm. unlike the rest of Latin America. Um, 
but supporting other kinds of economic, uh, other actions against Venezuela, uh, which are, you know, hardly Democrat, Democrat just published that uh, 11 journalists this year have been killed. Oh. Mexico tops the, the, um, the record uh, throughout the world, I think. Oh. Um, and it's not the first year, it's year after year in the case of Mexico. The 43 students who were uh, disappeared in Iguala in, in, in Mexico. And the list goes on, and then Honduras, of course. So the, li the list goes on and on and on. Uh, so the fact that there are questionable uh, measures that are taken, actions that are taken from a democratic viewpoint, the fact of the matter is that, in other ways, Venezuela is very democratic under the Chavistas. Um, so it's mixed. Um, but I, I, in my opinion, uh, it's democratic. It continues to be democratic. Um, you have freedom of press. You go into bookstores at the airport, and you won't find any newspaper, perhaps, that is pro-government. It's all anti. So how can you call Venezuela a dictatorship? The airport is state-run. So how can you call Venezuela a dictatorship? The opposition you know, has access to the media. They have meetings. They. Uh, uh, have all the rights of uh, opposition uh, organizations in any democratic country in the world. So Venezuela is democratic. And so the narrative of the opposition is to talk about the economic problems, and they're very, very dire. Uh, it's, it's a very dire situation in Venezuela. And so they go on and on and on about that, and people listen, and they know that it, it's more or less true. Might be a little bit exaggerated, but okay. And then they throw in the fact that Venezuela is a dictatorship. Uh, so the two get conflated, and that's highly deceptive. Now, why do they do that? I mean, why do they have to talk about democracy if they have enough to talk about on the economic front? Because if it's just about economics, you can't justify intervention. You can't justify uh, invoking the democratic charter of the OAS. You can't justify financial embargo like the one that the Trump administration um, has implemented. You can't justify military intervention, which is you know, on, the, on the table, according to Trump and others in the Trump government. You can't justify any of those things, because economic problems, you have them throughout the, th the third world. And if that was your criteria, the United States would be intervening in, in all of Africa, much of Latin America, and maybe parts of Asia as well. So. Um, that uh, is necessary for them to bring in this other factor, the democratic uh, side, and um, that is highly deceptive. Uh, okay, now, I want to talk about <clears throat> uh, the position of uh, people on the left who are very critical, highly critical, of the Chavistas. And I draw a distinction between people who are critical, even highly critical, of Maduro, but who recognize the good and the bad, uh, and recognize that the enemy is not the government, but the opposition, and a position which is very prevalent on the left in the United States and elsewhere, which says that basically that the government hasn't done anything good and that the opposition and the government um, are more the same. They place in the same sack. Uh, it's a plague on both your houses position. Uh, you see this in academia and you see this uh, I imagine in political organizations, the states, so I'm not that familiar with different political organizations. But for instance, um, uh, you know, uh, Democracy Now!, I think uh, some of Amy Goodman's programs reflect that, or some of the people that she interviews, uh, if she interviews um, somebody like Mark Weisbrot, who's, who's pro-government, uh, critical, but pro-government, mm -hmm. and somebody else who's got the other position. Uh, Jacobin Magazine 
uh, has published some positive, they published two articles of my own, um, and, and other articles that you know present one side, but then others that present that position. Um, so uh, in academia, there is a position that is referred to as neo-extractivism, uh, which is that the economies of the pink tide governments are as dependent on uh, primary commodities, be it um, uh, uh, soybeans, be it oil, hydrocarbons, um, or other com uh, commodities uh, that are sold on the international market. And the, 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 these governments, these progressive governments, haven't done anything to try to diversify. Um, and the dependence uh, is the same as before, or in some cases, maybe even worse. Because some of these writers say, well, look, uh, in the old days, before neoliberalism, you had what's known as import substitution, which was an attempt to diversify social democratic type governments, you know, centrist governments or governments a little bit to the left were trying to promote diversification and uh, opening up the internal market. It was known as, um, in, in Spanish, desarrollo hacia dentro, development from within. In other words, increase the internal market, produce less for exports, and prioritize production for the internal markets. Um, so now you have these pink tide governments that are financing their social programs with exports, but the fact of the matter is that now the um, uh, insertion of these countries in the global economy is worse than before. And they're financing the social programs um, with the money, with the income, with the revenue from these exports. And so the exports, uh, the, 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 the social programs, are actually uh, negative because they convince people that the exports and the export economy is necessary. So it draws attention away from the dependence on you know, the exports. Um, and so this is a position that leftist academic writers uh, taking in everybody a lot of people here probably know the name James Petrus. Uh, some of you, I'm sure John knows the name, uh, uh, Jeffrey Weber. That's his position. Um, and, um, and, and, and others who are uh, Latin American writers. Uh, w w one is uh, Alberto Acosta, who was um, Correa, Correa's right-hand man. He was the head of the... Constitu Constituent Assembly, I think was a minister under Correa. He broke with Correa, and he's uh, um, uh, avidly anti-Correa. And he says, he says, I don't know if the left has done anything good uh, in Latin America, not just Ecuador, throughout Latin America, the pink tide. I don't know if they've done anything good. So um, I would argue, firstly, that their position on dependence is correct, unfortunately. Uh, Venezuela is as dependent on oil as ever before. And that's true with other pink tide governments. Uh, so they're correct on that ground. But I think that the context is important because, it, just to talk specifically about Venezuela, uh, when the business sector tried to overthrow Chavez in 2002 with the coup, and it was the big business sector that was really the key actor, not the politicians on the right, not organized labor on the right. It was the Chamber of Commerce, Fede Cambras, uh, and the president of Venezuela for those two days that Chavez was ousted was the president of Fede Cambras. And the general strike was not a strike, it was a lockout. And the, the next president of Fede Cambres, Carlos Fernandez, was the one that led that also. So Chavez established a policy of not providing those business sectors with any benefits in terms of preferential treatment. Uh, he devised a strategy of providing be beneficial 
treatment, priority treatment, on, on a number of economic programs to those business people who had not supported the coup and who had not supported the general strike. But that was an, basically an emerging capitalist group. Um, and so the diversification wasn't possible. Um, and that led into a lot of corruption as well. So, and corruption is a big problem. So my point is that you've got to understand the context, the political context. Those uh, policies were followed. They weren't mistaken policies. They were necessary from a political viewpoint. It would have been foolish, and Chavez was anything you want other than foolish. It would have been foolish for Chavez to have said, you know, let's forget about what happened last year. Okay, Fede Camus tried to overthrow the government twice, but I'll forget about that. I'm interested in diversification, um, and uh, I'm going to try to, um, along with the private sector, promote diversification in order to sever dependence. Had he done that, they would have had more money and they would have tried to overthrow him again. So from a political viewpoint, it was necessary. But there were mistakes that were made. Um, but th th this concept of extractivism, neo-extractivism, ignores that, ignores the context. There's no discussion at all about context. There's no discussion at all. I haven't seen it, and I've read you know, a lot of these works uh, for you know, my academic publications. Um, there's no talk about what happened in 2002, 2003. There's no talk about the blockade. All these people are opposed. Uh, you know, Weber is a leftist. Petrus, I'm sure a lot of you know Petrus. His credentials as a leftist go back to you know, the 60s. He's an old timer, and I respect him very much. Uh, but you know, uh, I reviewed a book of his that he co-edited. The, 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 there's no attempt to say, all right, mistakes have been made, but they've made in the context of this economic war against Venezuela. And the second point is that there are four areas which we can talk about in terms of breakthroughs. And Art mentioned the title of my new book, which is uh, break, sh Breakthroughs and Shortcomings uh, in Latin America, in 21st century Latin America. Um, there are four areas uh, where you can talk about breakthroughs, but also shortcomings. What, one is democracy. Uh, the democratic model in Venezuela is one of participatory democracy. That was incorporated in the Constitution of 1999. It was incorporated into the Constitution of Bolivia and Ecuador as well. And that has expressed itself in many forms. I'll mention just two. One is community council movement that the government promoted and uh, uh, inspired uh, and stimulated in 2006 with uh, community council law. And those programs involved community councils developing public works programs, applying for funding, carrying out those programs, monitoring the programs, that created a sense of empowerment, incorporation, and participation by people not only in the popular sectors of the, uh, of the population, but also the marginalized sectors. In other words, the popular sectors taking in you know, working class people, but also marginalized sectors. In other words, those people in the informal economy who had no previous experience with organization and organizational discipline. So these neo-extractivism writers who and others who talk about a plague on both your houses, the pink tie governments like that of Venezuela is just, are just as bad as the opposition. They don't see both sides. They don't talk. I mean, maybe they, they know about it, but if you read their articles and their works, they, they, they don't say, well, there's good and bad uh, with regard to democracy. They talk, some of them, Svampa, uh, who's a uh, Argentine uh, professor in England, uh, she talks about hyper-presidentialism, uh, uh, excessive presidential power, uh, which is true, which is true. Uh, and that limits democracy. But the other side of the coin are these programs that promote participatory democracy. And a second example of that is the system of referendums and recall elections. We don't have that in the states as Venezuela has it, 
if we did, we'd be able to, the people could perhaps impeach um, Trump, mm -hmm. or they could block some of the legislation or some of the executive orders. Uh, in Venezuela, there are different types of referendums that are, have been incorporated in the Constitution and have been put to practice. Recall elections um, in Venezuela in 2007, referendums, there have been several of them, so that, uh, that uh, th 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 three of them, three of them. Uh, so that is another example of participatory democracy that goes beyond electoral democracy. Um, okay, the second area is the area of uh, the economic area with regard to um, uh, w with regard to the uh, economic model. Um, the uh, specifically with regard to Venezuela. Uh, there has been uh, an assertion of state control of the economy. People have mixed feelings about that. But the fact of the matter is that throughout Latin America, and specifically Venezuela, the idea of state control of the strategic sector, or what the Constitution of 1961 calls the ba um, la, in, la, in basic industry, um, uh, is something that that uh, most political parties in Venezuela have favored for an extended period of time, and not just leftist parties, but centrist parties as well. As I said before, it was incorporated in the Constitution of 1961. So Chavez, when he was re-elected president in 2006, he nationalized steel, he nationalized electricity from Verizon, by the way. From Verizon. Verizon. Um, the the, the uh, telephone company was privatized. It was bought by GTT, and Verizon bought GTT. So Verizon oh. owned uh, Cantave, which is the Venezuelan telephone company. Uh, so he nationalized telecommunications. He nationalized the cement industry, uh, and he renationalized the oil industry. Although it's more complex, but that was a term that he used that he nationalized the oil industry. Uh, I wouldn't go that far, but he asserted greater state control over the oil industry. Um, and then other industries as well. Now, the argument of the opposition is that these companies have been mismanaged. Uh, and they have been. Part of the problem is that the price controls uh, have um, been such that the private sector is able to get around the price controls mm -hmm. easier than the state. The state companies too, don't do that. So for instance, uh, 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 Los Andes, uh, which is the, the milk dairy company, they're, they're, they're selling milk perhaps below the cost of production. So that's part of the problem. That has to be analyzed, um, the price structure, uh, and the importance of the marketplace, which I don't think Maduro takes seriously, uh, which he should. Um, so that's part of the criticism. But the fact of the matter is that even if you can see the point that many of these companies have been mismanaged, the point of the matter is that these expropriations and the role of the state in the economy serve as a point of reference in national debate and an inspiration for progressives. Um, and the fact that subsequently these companies have been mismanaged doesn't detract from that. Because when the nationalization took place, all progressive had, progressives had to applaud that. It was progressive. It was far-reaching. Um, and it's something, I mean, I, you can make a comparison with the nationalization of the oil industry in Mexico in 1938 when uh, Lázaro Cárdenas nationalize the oil industry, I mean, that has served as an inspiration uh, and a point of reference for the Mexicans, you know, ever since then, and for the left throughout Latin America ever since then. Now, the fact that Pemex uh, was subsequently mismanaged doesn't uh, detract from the importance, historically speaking, of the nationalization of the oil industry. So that's the second point, that 
the economic policy has to be taken into consideration by progressives, leftists who talk about neo-extractivism and talk about dependency and talk about the fact that these countries have not broken out of the global economy. Um, and a third factor is with regard to uh, the military. Uh, the Chavistas have promoted a concept of an alliance, a civilian military alliance, mm -hmm. that has really been revolutionary for Venezuela. Uh, the military today is not like it was back in the old days. Uh, nevertheless, there's a lot of corruption in the military. And that also has to be contextualized because they have taken a beating. Uh, they're called upon to uh, handle these protests, these demonstrations that have become deadly. Um, they are called upon to deal with the problem of contraband. Uh, and they're the ones that are going to take, a, are going to face uh, the United States armed forces if there's an invasion, which I don't, I don't anticipate, but Trump is promoting that idea precisely in order to encourage a military coup in Venezuela to, you know, these people are human beings, and the fact that they might have to face the world's greatest power in the history of the military um, is a daunting, uh, you know, uh, possibility. And, you know, obviously his strategy is to promote uh, a coup. In fact, he stated as much as, as Marco Rubio. So, um, this strengthens the military, and it means that, okay, there's corruption in the military, but in this kind of situation, it's much more difficult for the government to clamp down on that corruption when you depend on the military so much. So it strengthens the hands of the military within the government. It means the government basically will be less democratic because the military is by its nature a non-democratic institution. Um, but that context has to be uh, appreciated. And so, okay, there's a plus side and a downside to, to these three factors. There's a fourth factor that doesn't have any downside, and that is foreign policy. And these analysts uh, don't talk about that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the people who have a plague on both your houses position, uh, they're progressives. Some of them are on the, very much on the left, and yet they don't talk about that. Uh, with regard to foreign policy, there isn't any downside. Chavez, from the very beginning, talked about a multipolar world, and uh, he promoted that uh, by promoting Latin American integration, by promoting Latin American unity. Uh, he was the main person behind uh, uh, CELAC, which is a Latin American organization. He and Fidel were the main per people behind ALBA, which is another Latin American organization taking in the leftist uh, governments, the pink tide governments um, more on the left, and UNASUR, in which he had a lot to do with that also. So, and Mercosur, which got transformed precisely because Chavez stated from the very beginning that one of the objectives of his government, you know, when he was elected president back in 1998, was that Venezuela would form part of Mercosur. So, Latin American unity was promoted. Uh, that was a heavy blow to Pan-Americanism. In Latin American 20th century history, or actually uh, Latin American history going back to the 19th century, uh, there's been an ongoing tension and debate between Latin American unity and Pan-Americanism, which takes in North America, the United States, and Canada. Um, and the OAS is an example of Pan-Americanism. Well, these organizations uh, promote uh, Latin American mm -hmm. unity um, and the position of, of Chavez, for instance, in, in the Quebec City uh, foreign minister, uh, um, uh, meeting of the OAS before he really confronted uh, the United States was that, okay, we can, you know, negotiate with the United States, but we'll negotiate when we are in a position of equality. Uh, but at this point, we have to promote unity in order to strengthen our position in order to negotiate as equals. So that's a fourth area which has to be brought into the picture. And um, uh, so I just want to say that a Marxist uh, 
uh, an analysis, I think, goes beyond economism. And I would say that these neo-extractivism writers, uh, to a certain extent, um, are presenting an extract, a, a, a uh, economistic uh, analysis in the sense that what they say about the insertion of these countries in the global economy is absolutely correct. But that's not everything. And I, I, I think there's a Marxist tradition that takes in Gramsci, that takes in Lukacs, Lukacs uh, that takes in um, uh, uh, a number of writers that uh, argue that transformation is not just about economics uh, and that uh, different areas have to be brought into the picture, the cultural side. And I've just presented you know, four different areas that are very much part of the transformation process. So that even though uh, there is this limitation with regard to uh, transformation, which is the dependency has not been broken, uh, nevertheless, there are other factors that have to do with the sense of empowerment, a sense of organization, uh, a strengthening of um, the political position of progressive forces, um, cultural transformation. You know, Tele Sur, for instance, uh, is a, a communications network. It's a television channel that's seen throughout Latin America and has played a very important role. That was an initiative of Chavez. Um, so that this also has to be, has to be brought into the picture. Um, and I'll, one, one last thing uh, I want to mention is that uh, I think that even though uh, I am critical of a lot of aspects of the Maduro government, and some of the aspects of, of Chavez in retrospect. Um, I think you've got to appreciate that Maduro faces challenges that Chavez didn't. Uh, firstly, Latin America is completely different. He can't uh, rely on the solidarity that Chavez did that played such an important role. Uh, the support that Venezuela got from Brazil, for instance, at the time of the general strike, in which Venezuela was importing gasoline from Brazil. Um, uh, the situation now is just the opposite. Mm -hmm. The price of oil, you know, went up under the Chavez government, mm -hmm. and uh, and since uh, uh, 2014 has nosedived. Uh, uh, and the world situation is different as well, with Trump, with uh, rightist governments in Europe more so than in the past. Yeah. So these differences have to be accounted for. But the other thing I want to say, one, one of my criticisms of Maduro is that um, I consider to be, him to be, um, uh, and comparing him with Chavez, uh, not open, even though he pays lip service to self-criticism. He's not open to self-criticism. He hasn't... Um, been very open to different currents that are critical of his government, but are within the Chavista movement. Um, and some of them, which are not really in the Chavista movement, support the Chavista movement. Um, uh, but I think that uh, w one of the things that I want to share with you is that within the Chavista movement, um, there's a great amount of diversity. Uh, for instance, in the recent Congress of the PSUV, Elias Howard, who is one of the, I'd say, four, five, or six most important Chavista leaders uh, from the very beginning, uh, called on the party to call <coughs> internal elections uh, and to consult the rank and file. Uh, the, uh, Maduro people, or the machine people within the party was opposed to that, but he had a lot of support for that. Um, Bernal, who I don't know where, where he stands in terms of what current he's in, but Fred Bernal, who's a very important leader at the national level, um, stated that something similar to what Fidel stated a few years before he died. Fidel said, 
You know, we can't attribute all the problems in Cuba, the economic problems and others, to U.S. imperialism. Mm -hmm. And that's what Bernal said. Mm -hmm. You know, this war is, has taken its toll in Venezuela. Uh, it's done a lot of damage. But we've been in power for almost 20 years. And we can't blame it all on, on imperialism. We have to analyze things and try to overcome the errors that have been committed all along. So there's a certain amount of diversity within the Chavista movement. But the hardline <laughs> position of the United States uh, plays into the hands of the hardliners within Venezuela. And even more than Maduro, the hardliner within the Chavista movement is Diosdado Cabello. He's the second uh, man in command of the Chavista movement. Um, he comes from the military. Uh, and he's a hardliner, not on economic policy, but he's a hardliner in terms of uh, internal discussion and also in terms of the opposition, which, you know, to a certain extent is justified. But you see a difference between him and Maduro. Maduro talks about dialogue. I'm willing to sit down and talk even to, to, to Trump. Uh, I'm willing to talk with the opposition. And uh, Diosdado Cabello's, uh, he's got a, pro a TV program. Uh, and all he talks about is the opposition. He mocks the opposition. Uh, he points to contradictions and everything, which is good. But that's practically all he talks about. So there are differences within the Chavista movement. And um, I think we have to appreciate that there's a correlation, there's a relationship between the animosity, the hostility, and the actions of the Trump administration and other governments throughout the world, and the opening up, the um, pluralism within the Chavista movement. Uh, Chavez's slogan, unity, unity, and more unity, mm. uh, was a response to that threat. You know, he said, basically, we have to be unified. We have to close ranks, because in a wartime si type situation like this, we have to be unified. And that gets interpreted to mean, you know, we have to put off the criticisms, because we're facing such a difficult situation, and we can't afford to engage or to indulge in uh, ongoing self-criticism. And there's a logic to that. So there's, uh, that's another reason for progressives in Latin America to oppose uh, the sanctions, to oppose the threats of military intervention in Venezuela, because it's going to help the Venezuelan people uh, deal with uh, the problems that Venezuela faces and move Venezuela in a progressive direction. Uh, that will have great implications for Latin America and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have time for some questions. Uh, people can stop over, get a cookie, and uh, Fred. Thanks, Steve. Um, very complex and good presentation. Thank you. Yeah. What I've been saying to people, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if we take the 2017 presidential election in Venezuela and cite criticisms of it that instead of 80% participation, they only had 43%, and that because they didn't allow the refugees uh, from Venezuela easily to vote, so they lost 2 million votes, they had 43% participation, and um, Maduro won by about 60%. Now, in the United States, in our presidential election, we had about, I think, 40% participation, and the president-elect won by 49%. So I, I <laughs> cause, what, cause, what, what, Trump? because yeah, Trump had about 49% of the vote, I don't think and Clinton had 50%. Well, she, he, Clinton had more votes than Trump. Yeah, no. So which is more democratic, I guess, is what I've been saying to people. Now, do you think that's a fair <coughs> response to the criticism that there's no yeah. democracy in Venezuela? Yeah, for, for, I think that, uh, you know, that, that's a good point. And it confirms what I said before, that the devil is in the de detail. And you have to know some of the facts. I know, you know people aren't going to be experts, um, uh, but you have to know some of the facts, uh, precisely for that reason. Because the, the point you're making, I think, is part of a larger argument in which you can bring up other aspects as well. And that is that you've got to make a distinction between um, 
weaknesses of democracy, and even violation of certain democratic norms, and electoral fraud. And that, that word, fraud, is not used much by the opposition. I would define fraud, I mean, you can define it as you, as you like, but I would define fraud as um, with regards to vote counting. When you uh, change the, the vote count, when you uh, announce uh, a vote that doesn't correspond to um, what, what, what is really happening at the polls, that is fraud. And that means that that country is not democratic, especially if it's a massive kind of thing. Um, but in Venezuela, the opposition doesn't use that term much. And when they do, they misuse it. At least if that's your definition of fraud, then they're misusing it. Because they don't talk about that. Because they can't. Because you don't have vote, vote, voting fraud in Venezuela. You know, sometimes they say, ah, oh, there were well, people who voted more than once. Well, that, that's um, really idiotic. Because you, you can't alter an election. Uh, and you can't do that on a massive scale. I mean, you know, imagine if you were to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people doing that. That that would be exposed easily. Um, so they say, you know, people who passed away, uh, there's records of the fact that they voted in the elections. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it happened once or twice. Um, so, okay, you you can point to weaknesses, and that's one of them. I mean, Fred's point is accurate. The um, abstention was very high. It was high because the opposition, or sectors of the opposition, were supporting abstention. It was also high, by the way, because a lot of people were disillusioned with the opposition. And, uh, you know, you, 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 it didn't really make sense because part of the opposition was calling for, for abstention. And people would say, you know, I don't believe in the opposition at all. I'm not going to vote. But by not voting, you were supporting one sector of the opposition against another sector. But the point of the matter is that, OK, that's true. But and I think that's good that you compare that to the United States. You can also say, look at, take the United States. You know, there are between five and seven million ex-felons. No, felons, people who were jailed uh, and are now free people who should have the right to vote, and they can't vote. No, right. And if they can't vote, it's such a uh, ongoing bureaucratic process right. that they virtually cannot vote. Right. So you have between five and seven million people who would, under normal circumstances, vote for the Democrats or vote for the Green Party, hopefully the right. latter, but not for the Republicans. Right. So that is one example. Uh, voting suppression is another example. Gerrymandering, and all this has been you know, well documented, and then the US Electoral College in which, as Fred mentions, um, uh, you know, you know, I have a hard time in Venezuela <clears throat> explaining to people, uh, separating <clears throat> the fraud in Florida in 2000 and the fact that Gore got uh, over 600,000 more votes than Trump. Because when I when I explain when I talk about that. They say, oh, that, that's the fraud. In other well, words, Gore really got more votes. But I say, no, even if you forget about Florida, even if you forget well, about the fraud, let's concede that. The candidate that got more votes didn't win. And people right. say, if there's a baseball game, where in, in sports does a team who get, which gets more runs than another team uh, lose the game? So nobody can understand that, just here in the United States. And I think most people, many people in the United States can't understand that either. So I think that what, what, you're, what you're doing in your conversations uh, is quite valid uh, by going to the specifics and demonstrating with specific facts that uh, the media and the opposition in, in Venezuela and the Trump administration are really deceiving people. All right. uh, Joe? Yeah. Um in the United States, you hear a lot about the opposition demonstrations, but you never hear about a pro-Chavista demonstration. And I saw a picture of one not too long ago. I think it was a May Day demonstration, which was perhaps the biggest demonstration I had ever seen. Um, but you, it wasn't recorded in the United States. But So it's clear there's some support for the government, a lot of support for the government. Yeah. So I'm wondering uh, a couple of things. One is, what do your students think 
two is when there's a situation like you mentioned in your town where there was a handful of people at the barricades. Why don't people go and start taking down those barricades? And the third overall question, which is the bigger one, which I why in Venezuela could they not do what they did in Cuba? And um, I know there's a big opposition in Venezuela, but the opposition grows the more you haven't done that. Why haven't they been able to nationalize and democratically control to ensure that there wouldn't be the kind of corruption, the um, economy, and the political structures um, in Venezuela like they did in Cuba? Yeah. Well, uh, w with regard to your your question about the barricades, um, I think that's a reflection of a um, a process in which there is a um, the, the, the the Chavista movement uh, has become less and less uh, enthusiastic. Uh, um, you know, in Spanish, the word is disgaste. Do you know how to say disgaste in a, a wearing down process? Uh, wasting away. What was that? Wasting away. Wasting away. Uh, so that, I mean, it's been almost 20 years. And in any kind of situation, that, yeah. that's almost yeah. inevitable. Right. Um, uh, you know, uh, Weber said that uh, charismatic leadership can't last forever. Eventually, people just get tired. Uh, so, so that takes, th that, that's one factor. But another factor is that, well, you know, there's corruption, there's a lot of talk about corruption, and people see it with their own eyes. So th that, that affects people. I can say, for instance, that I, I was involved in uh, the PSUV. I went to their meetings. Uh, and um, th that has really uh, almost faded, faded away, at least where I live. Um, you know, there were, at first, a lot of participation, and then less so, and less so, and less so, and it's just petered out. So, I mean, th there's no question that that is happening. And your, your point about the barricades is very well taken. The opposition could not have done that um, on a massive scale. They, they did it, in, I, I saw it in 2007. Um, they did it in 2003 as well, uh, but it was just isolated. And in 2007, I saw it, but it was in the eastern part of Caracas, the wealthy, very well, Altamira, that's where I saw it. Very wealthy area of Caracas, okay. Um, but they couldn't do it where I live, which is, you know, less wealthy, you know, middle class, um, but not upper middle class. Uh, whereas they did it in 2017. So the Chavistas don't have the kind of gung-ho enthusiasm that they had before. That, that's the reality, unfortunately. But they all, they, but they do have a mobilization capacity. Um, uh, uh, and I mean, I've seen that. Uh, I've, um, I've seen the enthusiasm at some of these rallies. Uh, for instance, I went to one. Uh, it, it was. It might have been a, a little over a year ago, um, but it, it was massive. Uh, and the, unfortunately, the Chavista leaders showed up. It was, oh, it was, I don't know, I don't remember, maybe an hour and a half, two hours, people were just s sitting there. Um, and when they, but everybody was super enthusiastic during that, that whole period that they were waiting. And then finally, you know, the rally began, there were speeches, and everybody was super enthusiastic. The opposition says, oh, these people get paid. Well, that's not the case, because if people get paid, or if these are state bureaucratic uh, employees who are forced to go, they're, they're not going to jump up and you know go like that. So there is a degree of th enthusiasm, but there are levels of enthusiasm. And one is you go to a rally, another is you take down barricades and you face the opposition. Uh, and that, that I think, you know, is a demonstration of the fact that people are less enthusiastic than they were a while back. And um, with regard to democratic control, um, look at, uh, uh, there, there is the subjective factor. You know, Marxists talk about objective factors and subjective factors. And the subjective factor, uh, you can say a lot of enthusiasm uh, under Chavez, but 
um, when you uh, try to harness that enthusiasm, there's a whole different dynamic. Because when you try to organize that enthusiasm, and you try to channel it along those lines, uh, it takes a degree of political maturity, of political uh, experience, political discipline. There, there are a whole set of there's a whole set of factors there. Um, and just to give one example, Chavez promoted uh, a socialist plan for the workers of the industrial region. Uh, which is called, which is Guayana. Guayana takes in the states of, basically the state of Bolivar. And that's where the steel factory is located, that's where the, the iron is located, that's where the aluminum is located. Um, so it's called the Zona de Hierro, the, 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 the iron zone, which takes in heavy industry. And so he called it the Plan Socialista de Guayana, the social plan of Guayana. Uh, that was like in 2009. He nationalized the steel industry in 2008. And then he uh, promoted the plan socialism. It, but it wasn't a top-down kind of thing. The workers themselves were calling for that. And um, that consisted of worker presidents of all these state companies in Guyana. So they're called worker presidents. Um, the steel company, the aluminum company and all the companies were worker. That is, that the workers themselves chose, and in most, most cases, they were workers. Not in the case of the steel company, but he was somebody that the workers chose. And in the case of the aluminum company, he was an ex, you know, he was a, 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 a worker, a worker of that, that industry. It didn't work. Even though all the Chavista unions, all the unions were Chavista, all the unions were on the left. The uh, traditional opposition didn't have any support at all in the union movement in that area. Mm -hmm. But the Chavistas, uh, Chavista unions, you know, fought among themselves. And uh, it resulted in confrontations, you know, violence. And it didn't work. It didn't work. Now, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go into the details as to why it didn't work. But what I want to say is that, um, uh, these subjective conditions have to be taken into consideration. When we talk about worker control, um, it's not that easy. And th th there's a book by uh, Asselini, uh, Dario Asselini. In fact, I've got it with me because I'm reviewing it for Science and Society, uh, the, the Marxist Journal. Um, a very, very good writer. I'm, I haven't begun to read the book yet, but I'm sure it's a good one. So Asselini on worker control in Venezuela. But those are details that are, you know, um, uh, have to be taken into consideration. Uh, and certainly, worker control uh, has to be the objective. But how to, how to achieve it, you know, it's perhaps not that easy. Thank you. Um, do you see any hope of a separate economy developing that would decouple from the Western capitalist system in Latin America? Well, uh, I would say that this was the goal of the left uh, in much of the 20th century. Um, this idea of import substitution that I mentioned before, and um, the strategy on much of the left, uh, the, the communist movement that actually was promoted by Lenin uh, in the early days of the common term, which was the idea is that there is a progressive bourgeoisie, an anti-imperialist bourgeoisie, and the left and the workers' movement would ally itself with that anti-imperialist uh, bourgeoisie and bring about a revolution that was not socialist, but was uh, had as its objectives democracy, industrialization, agrarian reform, um, uh, and anti-imperialism. Those were like the four main objectives of that stage. And the socialism would be the, the following set of objectives. I would say that in the age of globalization, uh, that is less likely. And the fact of the matter is that Leftists as a whole in Latin America no longer talk about that, uh, maybe with a few exceptions, but they don't talk about a, 
uh, progressive bourgeoisie and certainly not an anti-imperialist bourgeoisie because the bourgeoisie is more integrated into yeah. the global capitalism. Um, and so, for instance, in Venezuela and other pink tide countries, they talk about a productive bourgeoisie. And that's exactly what the Chavista strategy was, which I mentioned before, of an emerging bourgeoisie that would produce, not necessarily you know, be a strategic ally, but would be a tactical ally, on the one hand, politically speaking, and on the other hand, would promote economic development. Uh, so I would say that uh, that's really not uh, the vision. It might be a very long-term goal, but I don't think it's what the strategy is about, at least at this stage. I think the strategy would be about a, uh, an economy that was not dependent on outside capital, uh, but not necessarily outside of the global that You know, the Chinese under Mao promoted the idea of self-sufficiency and artaki, artaki, which meant that the country would just be self-sufficient and not have any necessary, would not necessarily have ties with the rest of the world. And I don't hear anybody saying this at, at this point. Hmm. Well, yes. um, I, I found it interesting, the anecdote you mentioned about the brother from Boston doing solidarity work and saying that sort of the, the details didn't matter. Uh, I just want to flip that for a second and say that, you know, when I, I'll date myself here, when I first came around the left as a teenager in the 1980s when CISPIS was having demonstrations and doing Nicaragua solidarity work, what won me to Marxism were Marxists who were not afraid to say that there was no third road to socialism or no other path and that the Sandinistas would ultimately fall if they did not draw the conclusions of, say, the Russian Revolution and recognize the need to smash the capitalist state and to carry out mass expropriations of the industry and the haciendas. And I know you don't do that in 24 hours, but and one of the things that um, was eye-opening to me about um, Fidel Castro and, and some of the limitations of Cuba was that they didn't counsel to go down that path. But when you mentioned, say, the 2002 coup, I do think that the working class and socialists have a side, and that it is in the streets opposing the coup that was obviously straight out of a CIA playbook and that at that moment you are in a military bloc with Chavez. Maybe some people will understand here, some comrades, the historical example if I say, you know, with Kerensky against Kornilov, but also down with Kerensky. Um, I don't think that uh, Chavez uh, or a Maduro, uh, you know, deserves a vote of support any more than I would think a Daniel Ortega or a Nelson Mandela would uh, should receive electoral support from from socialists. Uh, full disclosure: James Petrus and I passed through the same political tradition at different points in our lives and different times in that tradition. I recognize a lot of his analysis and am still sympathetic to it, although I find his conclusions today overly pessimistic and abstentionist. Uh, you know, I think it's a difficult time to be a revolutionary optimist, but I would say that the road that we still need to, to push for is the road of Lenin, in, in a sense, and that while we can't build socialism in one country, if, if there were a real left Marxist movement able to split the Chavistas uh, to the left and, and to overthrow the government from the left, that that would be inspirational and renewing to the situation in Cuba and to other countries throughout Latin America. So, so then it wouldn't be isolated any, anymore in a sense. I mean, one can imagine an alliance with a, a revolutionary Nicaragua or a revolutionary Brazil that, that would be able to resist at least some of the encroachments of US imperialism. Yeah, let, let, let me just uh, say one thing that uh, you'll probably agree with. And that is that uh, I think these 20 years, uh, in the case of Venezuela, demonstrates that in spite of all the challenges and the difficulties and the arguments contrary to what you're saying, that there are certain moments in which you just can't uh, push ahead uh, and you've got to be in a defensive mode or what have you, that there were certain moments, there have been certain moments during these 20 years in which a lot could have been done because the Chavistas had the upper hand. And I think that's the key lesson is that 
when you have the upper hand, you've got to take advantage of that. And I always use as, an ex as a counterexample uh, somebody who's not at all revolutionary, but that, that's the case of uh, Obama. When Obama was elected president, uh, there was, uh, he could have smashed the Republican Party on the issue of Guantanamo. There was a groundswell of horror about the torture in Guantanamo. And Obama said he wanted to be a good guy. Uh, and he said, you know, I, I, you know I, that what happened in Obama was torture, unlike what Bush said. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's get beyond that. Hmm. And that was from a political, I'm not talking about normative you know, ethics. I'm just talking about politics. That, for the Democratic Party, was a mistake uh, because the Republicans, you know, recovered from their blow and then, you know, moved into an offensive mode. Uh, he had a great opportunity to have smashed the Republicans. So that, that, that same principle can be applied to different moments of these 20 years. And I'll just give you a couple examples. Uh, Chavez did a lot after he was, okay. The, the first example would be after the coup that you mentioned. At that point, Chavez recognized his mistake. He tried to uh, engage the opposition in a dialogue. Uh, he had just defeated a coup. He could have moved aggressively against the opposition. Uh, and he said the, 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 the moment that he returned to Bitter Florida, the presidential palace, and he made that speech, and it was a speech of conciliation and reconciliation. Um, that was a mistake, uh, because he had the masses on the street, he could have done something. And he recognized that afterwards. Then, uh, after he was re-elected president in 2006, he did do a lot. I mentioned the nationalization, he created the PSUV, and he closed the uh, um, TV channel, Radio Caracas, which uh, promoted the coup. Even after the coup, they were promoting another coup. So, uh, he did that, but he could have done more. And why didn't do, he do more? Because he had a, an electoralist uh, mindset or an electoralist strategy in which he said, we're going to win the 2006 elections with 10 million votes. Well, 12, 10 million votes would have been 80% no. of the vote. He didn't need that. And the TV says, well, a conversation that I had, um, but I think this was a general thinking on the part of the TV says, we will demonstrate to the United States that Venezuela is democratic. Because if we can get 80% of the vote, then nobody in the United States can say that Venezuela is not democratic. Well, that showed a misunderstanding because liberal democracy, which is what our paradigm is all about in the United States, uh, says just the opposite. If somebody gets 80% of the vote, it's because he's a demagogue. Um, so that, that doesn't prove uh, what they wanted them to prove. But it was unnecessary. If he had won with much less, well, he got 63%. But if he hadn't been worried about that uh, and had defined other objectives, such as the struggle against corruption, inefficiency in the state sector, uh, and democratization of his own movement, which he did with the, with the new party, that, that, was, uh, that happened. But he could have done a lot more. And then with Maduro, Maduro hasn't done anything in that regard. He won the municipal elections of December of 2013 with 11.5% difference with regard to the opposition. Mm -hmm. And he could have moved, he didn't do anything. Uh -huh. Then the Guarimba was defeated in early 2014. That was an idea. The opposition was on the defensive. Um, a lot of people were killed. Mm -hmm. They were responsible for that. And Maduro could have done practically anything. And so he announced a uh, cabinet shakeup in Spanish, sacodon, shake up the cabinet. So this created great expectations for you know bringing in maybe more radicals. You know, I think you were mentioning different currents within the Chavez movement. <coughs> and then he put it off. Obviously, he was under pressure, so he put it off for a whole month. He announced it. I think he put it off a second time. And when he finally announced it, it was musical chairs for the most part, mm -hmm. going from you know changing one minister and placing him in another ministry. So that has happened. Defeated the Guarimba in 2017, he, at different moments. He could have done a lot more than he did. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, one of the, you know, um, Garcia Linera, who's the vice president in Bolivia, when Chavez died in March of 2013, um, the Foro de Sao Paulo, 
which is a, a group of leftist political organizations, uh, met in uh, Caracas. And Maduro was there. And Garcia Linera said the same thing I'm saying now. But he was looking Maduro right in the eyes. And he said, the lesson is that when you've got the upper hand, when you've triumphed, you've got to move the revolution of what's happening in Venezuela. Let's uh, finish up, and then Steve, maybe just stick around. And sure. She had a one more question. Yeah. One, one um, piece I want to close with you um, in the context of Cuba and the U.S. and Venezuela has to do with generationalism. Because if you look at Cuba, you have the people that have been born prior to the revolution and those who have been born after the revolution. And Cuba is trying to deal with that and trying to work with a generation that never experienced solidarity and also didn't experience what it was like to yes. live prior to the revolution. You have in our own country, you know, look at the, the young people in the movement with Bernie Sanders, okay? They had a perspective um, that uh, motivated them and moved them. Um, and then you have Venezuela, and that's where I have no knowledge, and I would like to hear how does generational differences play into um, movement for change within Venezuela, or does it? Boy, that's a good question. Uh, I've never thought about that. Yeah. But it's, it's um, uh, you know, when you give a lot of talks, you, you, you know so much that any question you can go like that. But if that wasn't, Sorry. I feel stumped. Um, can I, can I yeah, sure. forward you on that? I've read that in the past, Venezuela had basically a two-party state, very similar to the United States. The, the liberal women of bourgeoisie and the conservative women of bourgeoisie. And they like traded power, traded power for yeah. 40, 50, 60, 60. To at least select young people uh, as not, not, not so much, I don't know to what extent in the cabinet, but as deputies, you know, as con Congress people. Um, and they have stated that. I mean, they, they have, this is one of the uh, points that they, they, their appeals to voters is that a certain percentage are millennials or less than I don't know, 30, 35 years old. Um, so that, that is something and that, that's been compared to the opposition, that the opposition consists of uh, older people. And with regard to the opposition, uh, the, um, there is a generational difference. Um, the radicals on the opposition are younger, Leopoldo Lopez and Capriles, who I just mentioned, uh, they're you know, between 40 and 50 years old. And then you have the older folk like uh, Ramos that I mentioned. Uh, and, and there is a generational difference in terms of their discourse. Um, and the, the other thing is that the people who are protesting the, in the Guarimba, I mean, th there's a real hostility between those younger people who are many, are, some of them are students, high school students and younger people, and the opposition, there, there, there is real resentment. Um, so there's an anti-party discourse or an anti-party mindset mm -hmm. among the radicals on the streets and the opposition parties. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's one observation. But with regard to the Chavistas, um, I think that's one positive side is that they have made an effort to bring in um, uh, younger people and uh, as, as, as uh, Congress people, uh, city council, that, and, and even mayors and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But at the national level, I'm not sure in terms of the cabinet. Uh, I'd have to you know, think about that some more. That's a good question. I'm going to definitely explore that. <laughs> OK, thank you, Steve. For those people that have a question, <laughs> I, I think Steve will be here for a, a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I think some of us will go up to the Ale House so if you want to pursue a few more questions up the road here on River Street, feel free. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank you. Very, very Steve, you know, um, five